Greetings, everyone. My name is Tricia Rose, and I'm the director for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University, and this is Underlying Conditions. I'm here today with my dear colleague, Elena Shi, who's the Manning Assistant Professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown University. Her current book project, Manufacturing Freedom, Trafficking, Rescue, Rehabilitation, and the Slave free good, is under contract with the University of California Press and is a global ethnography of the transnational social movement to combat human trafficking in China, Thailand, and the United States. Our conversation today will focus on the increased anti-Asian racism and violence in the COVID era. Welcome, Professor Xi. Thank you so much for joining us on Underlying Conditions. Thanks so much, Trisha. I wish we were having this conversation in person. At the I know so much has been relegated to this crazy internet world, um, but um, I'm glad that the only upside of this is that we can share this with lots of other people. This incredible insight in your research. Now, I won't be the only beneficiary. We'll be able to share it with other people. Thanks to um, those who have tuned in and are tuning in. Let's start with sort of where we are right now. Um, the last several weeks, has we've seen a tremendous reckoning with an unprecedented rise of anti-Asian violence. And it, maybe it's not an unprecedented rise, but certainly more visible, um, culminating in the vicious murder of eight people in an Asian uh, massage business in Atlanta. So, and then since then, a number of other horrible things are beginning to get more public traction. So how do you understand this violence against Asian American community members as part of the COVID pandemic? Is it part of the COVID pandemic? Is it independent? What, what are the relationships between it? Yeah, thank you. Um, the events of March 16th, when eight people were you know, brutally murdered because of their proximity to an Asian massage business certainly served as a real galvanating force for so many people to come together. And I think in, now we're seeing near daily, weekly, um, protests, vigils, uh, on those on an unprecedented scale. So I think you're absolutely right that levels of violence and racism may not be unprecedented, but certainly the bottleneck and, and the fury and the feelings of invisibility that Asian American communities have been feeling for so long, I think were, were released after that horribly visible attack. Um, but something that I think organizers have been pointing to was that just two days before those brutal murders, a plane of 33 Vietnamese refugees who had lived largely their entire lives in the United States was deported back to Vietnam. And Southeast Asian organizers and activists like our very own Sarath Sung, who's a former ethnic studies student at Brown and co-founder of the Providence Youth Student Movement, now as director of the Southeast Asian Freedom Network, have really argued that we need to understand, quote, unquote, hashtag, stop AAPI hate within a broader rubric of state-sanctioned violence that has been mm. enacted on Asian American communities for decades. And so that we can't separate the isolated violent attacks of March 16th at the spas or of individual elders and women being pushed and attacked in public from larger systems, systems of fears of policing, systems where um, in the instance of massage workers, low wage workers are just, you know, completely have been completely marginalized by the pandemic. And I think it's those everyday more mundane forms of violence and surveillance that have been amplified by COVID, have been amplified by COVID related racism, and that we're, we're now seeing brutally exposed right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's no question that it's very important to connect these systemic practices, which seem to fly under the radar for everybody, right? It, it's, there is a tendency in our mediated world to focus on these individual stories and these individual instances of violence. That said, it is horrific and we don't want to minimize um, the, the, the brutality of what we've seen. I mean, um, it's not only the murders, which 
ironically is more American than anything else, right? This is kind of insanity. But then these other beatings, which I think what's important about many of them is that people are standing by yes. and not saying anything and not doing anything. And just in one case, closing a lobby door after this elderly woman who was beaten brutally and left. I mean, after the perpetrator leaves, even if you're afraid of him, because he seemed pretty tall, uh, you know, you go out and help the person, even if you didn't have the courage to physically engage during, you call the police, you go, how, how could you, you know, there's, there is something visceral and important about that, that shouldn't stop us from seeing the system, but there is something going on about what people, who people think are, who, to whom do they belong? Why are they perpetually not a part of the who we are? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that in the days after the the particular attack in Atlanta, media reached out with a lot of questions that seemed to center around whether or not these people were sex workers, whether or not they were victims of trafficking. And then right. secondarily, to really, really ask me to elucidate on how horribly squalid the labor conditions they must have been toiling under were under, as if those are the reasons to justify their humanity or the right. reason why we have to care that they were killed. And I think your question absolutely gets to that is of course the simultaneous invisibility and now hypervisibility of Asian Americans, the idea right. um, that uh, somehow Asian American communities won't speak back, that there's not gonna be um, some sort of like co community effort um, behind us. And so right. I think that um, that, that is one of the most shocking things is the lack of like a community fabric where bystanders have completely faded to the backdrop and yeah. are making, you know, there's been, there were incredible strides last summer, really, really focusing on how do we engage in more community oriented responses that don't necessarily steer us towards policing. So in lieu of right. having to call the police, what are other things that we can turn to? And it's clear that we need to work in that area because if nobody is stepping in, then still like this entire community of, of elders oh. at this point in, in Chinatowns, uh, in Koreatowns, they may feel like the only people who might come to them um, are the police. And I think that's a kind of like education that we need to like work on and work through intergenerationally is how do we show community oriented ways of like helping each other. And there's something particularly awful about beating up on old people and women in their sixties, you know, and women, I mean, there's just, there's, there's something really, uh, there's a sickness being expressed that I think is not just about you know, systemic violence from the top, but also a kind of systemic uh, ideology. Yes, of, a, a disenfranchisement. Yeah. I think like Kimberly Huang has written really beautifully about this. She tied like a certain kind of, um, you know, the kinds of right-wing populism that we see are, are rooted in a certain kind of fragility that is once racialized, that is gendered. And we right. see that coming out and like enacting violence on, quote unquote, most vulnerable right. Um, right. members of the population. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so one of the things that's happening, I want to get to, you know, this framing of sex work and, you know, the conditions of the, you know, to justify the violence. I want to hold that aside for a minute. I just have one other question first, which is, you know, one of the things that I think has happened and, you know, correct me here or, or, or elaborate, um, but it seems as if, unlike any other group of, of citizens, um, Asian Americans of all different specific backgrounds are being constructed as perpetrators rather than victims of the virus. And so you have, re the reality is that Asian Americans and th that we actually have less data showing the, their contraction rates. We have deficient information about their vulnerability for reasons related to immigrant status, multi-generational households, frontline workers, you know, all of the things that other communities of color who are poor also face. Um, and yet they, they, it's just not even on the table, right? There's only the imagined, the imagined framework of them being somehow responsible for it. Um, you know, how, how do we reverse this? You know, do we want more data around contraction? You know, how, how do we handle this contradiction? 
Yeah, I think that scholars and activists have been asking for a disaggregation of data for a really, really long time as a political project, like because we see such vast differences in, in ethnicity, country of origin from Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asians, um, East Asians. And then so so that being one huge, huge, huge um, continuum wow. in which people have drastically different experiences. And then maybe if you might see like a cross intersecting continuum of like socioeconomic status and types of migration that people came on and different types of work that they're working in. We have everything from Filipino essential workers who really dominate um, the healthcare industry to low wage workers like uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with Asian massage workers who are absolutely on the front lines of like different kinds of formal and informal work. And then you have, um, have always had East Asians who form a tier of like more status who have temporarily, you know, benefited from the privilege of maybe having um, the ability to social distance in their jobs. But those aren't necessarily, I mean, I think they cross cut because you can absolutely have like an elder East Asian who's still working as a home care worker. And so these, yeah. these stereotypes also of East Asians being um, overeducated, of being wealthy, of being um, in you know more secure professions also goes against us and contributes to that idea of like the monolith that we are all you know culpable for the disease and actually works to like, tear communities against one another because you have lots of Southeast Asian people. The man who died in California is an, is an elderly Thai gentleman. And a lot of communities saying like, I don't understand why I'm being pro like if this was actually supposed to be a Chinese virus as yeah, Trump what do I have to do with that? all this, what do I have to do with that? Like I'm not Chinese. Yeah. And so exactly. the, you know, the monolith of Asian America is, is really, really important. And I think Pacific Islander activists had really reminded us that they are not being racialized in the same way at this time. And so there's been a lot of talk about, and there always has been, how do we clump together like Asian America? Do we include Pacific Islander within that? How do we reckon with yeah. South Asian? and um, their exclusion from this. So I think data, data disaggregation is a great place to start, not just right. for COVID infection rates, but across the board. Right. And at the same time, data disaggregation helps our research. But for political solidarity, maybe the fact that everybody's getting lumped together can be politically productive. Because if I'm a Thai person, Thai American, and I'm going to get beat up because someone thinks I'm Chinese, and then the next time something happens, you know, like Japan and say, you know, the car industry and those attacks, you know, and that, so maybe there's, you know, the capacity to, to, to be more politically, uh, you know, so in, a, in a more solidarity oriented way to fight back as a collective. I mean, sort of doing both at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is hope in this moment, but there also needs like, like we cannot really come together until we reckon and are really honest with those fissures and the way that, you know, East Asian, Asian American organizations have absolutely contributed to the occlusion and erasure of um, many, many, many other groups within Asian America. And so I think there is a moment now then like for this cohesion to allow some of those groups to have more visibility and say, and to call attention to the so-called like more mundane everyday brutality right. that Asian Americans do face. Yeah, yeah. So not, you know, let's not have false solidarity, unity on top of conflict, <laughs> right? Let's, no, I get it. I, I'm totally, I think that's really insightful. So your research, you know, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly focuses on, you know, sex work and human trafficking. Um, and so one of the things, in a, not, not just the Atlanta moment, but the general sense that somehow this um, a compendium of, of Asian American women are somehow connected to human trafficking in the sex trade around the world as part of a kind of white male in particular, right, psyche about who these women are and what they're for, it, I think spans a space around this pandemic um, that is much more complex than the Atlanta shootings illuminate. And, and so I'd love to hear you talk about that, but I also wanted to uh, include in that general question that, that there seems to be a real comfort with um, imagining that his own sex addiction is somehow a legitimate explanation for this murder, right? So, 
I, I guess I want to talk, I have a million questions in this area, but let me just be quiet and let you talk about that. Like, you know, how do these things connect? The pandemic, the sort of sexual expectations uh, and the way race and gender are playing out here. Yes, I think the absolute hyper-masculinity um, of this moment in um, enacting violence perhaps on, you know, on Asian women has been well-documented and it traces its roots back to military and imperial conquest projects of like the US military throughout Southeast Asia. So throughout the world, I mean, in Thailand in particular, their commercial sex industry, their red light districts are really started because of American military involvement in Southeast Asia. And those ideas of the, you know, the sexualization, hypersexualization of Asian women definitely circulate back into the U.S. context where um, now we, we absolutely have those in play. But I think as a counterpart of what we're also seeing to these forms of white masculinity are a certain kind of moralistic white saviorhood that operates in tandem to white supremacy. So when you have white supremacy saying like, I can enact you know, sexual violence on Asian bodies, mm -hmm. and then you have white rescue saying, well, I'm going to come in these women because Asian women are equally deemed like ideal victims and you know like always perceived as sex slaves what you have are really really damaging projects of surveillance and policing that have been enacted on these communities mm. in the name of stopping human trafficking and so right. these are the like difficult entanglements that on the one hand you absolutely have the brute force and violence of white supremacy and a function of that you have all of these people coming in and saying that they're there to rescue people and it's really as I've seen the rescue efforts that have done more harm than good so even in the days after the Atlanta shooting the desire to send in police to these communities um, was pretty destructive to the everyday yeah. forms of surveillance they already feel yeah like the, that's not generally helpful um, you know. <laughs> In general, um, but you know, you, in your in your op-ed piece in the New York Times, you know, you also talk about the fact that what these women need, um, whether they're trafficked or choosing this labor, is they need labor protections, they need worker protections, they need worker rights. They don't need a moral narrative about the protection of of uh, uh, you know a kind of vulnerable women who, which is the same narrative that drives male sexual desire for them in the first place. So it's, you know, you're absolutely right to focus on that. Has, has there been a movement around helping people understand these women as um, uh, mistreated workers, right? Dominated workers in any way? I think we draw so much um, inspiration from and solidarity with the sex worker rights movement that have always argued that sex work is work. So using a worker right, a labor rights platform to advocate for rights within like different kinds of commercial sex economies. Mm -hmm. But pointing to that doesn't mean that all of these workers were necessarily sex workers no, because no. regardless of whether they were or were not, all Asian massage businesses are being subject to this kind of treatment. And I love the focus on underlying conditions because Asian massage workers and people working low wage service sector industries in, you know, in Asian businesses around the country first started experiencing the devastating economic effects of the pandemic in January. So COVID, you know, doesn't really close down businesses here till the last week of March. But in January, when people had already been hearing about the virus in China and Trump stoking fears of this being a, a you know, a, a China virus, you saw um, those the complete businesses. economic devastation of those communities. Oh. From So it's been like well over a year now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's those kinds of things that I think we still need to cont contend with that leave people vulnerable um, right. to, to, to COVID. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a really good point. And I guess I would expand, you know, sex workers needing rights and labor protections to all low wage workers right, needing these kinds of protections in, in various small businesses, whether it's nail salons, you know, massage parlors that uh, are genuinely just massage parlors or not, but basically that whole entire context. Um, but so um, how can we deploy and be in solidarity with and learn more about what kinds of organizations are doing, what kinds of work to help unpack this because there's a lot going on here, right? I mean, you've laid out in this short time a lot of pieces of this puzzle. How might a novice or a person who doesn't study these issues, you know, best attend to this to be informed? Because 
you know, there's the narrative, there's the Kung flu, there's this, you know, by bystander apathy, there's, you know, the, the, co the coalition versus solidarity versus hierarchies potentially within the broader Asian American community. Um, there's the elder dimension, there's the gender people, there's a lot. So help us think that you got a lot of work to do, Elena. You better, you okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm going to pare it down to maybe just three different areas yeah. that people could turn to. Perfect. So <laughs> rather than, you know, there's been a huge outpouring of support specifically for Asian massage workers. And ironically, in this moment, they don't want more eyes on them following the shootings because they already have too many eyes on them and their industries. So I think shifting our gaze slightly over as you said, to migrant and labor rights organizations gives us a, you know, supporting them gives us a general idea of um, the needs of that community at large. So in Flushing, um, I'd say Flushing Worker Center is running an incredible campaign alongside other organizations called Ain't I a Woman? And it's about the experiences of home care workers. So people who have to work, you know, domestic workers working 24 hours around the clock during the pandemic. Um, they are also working in coalition with the Flushing Anti-Displacement Alliance fighting against gentrification and um, a real now is um, the demands to keep Jingfang, one of the largest restaurants in Manhattan's Chinatown, um, open because it was the largest union employer of restaurant workers. So that just, you know, really specific to Flushing, we can put the links in, you know, we can attach the links in, and of course we can um, speak to those in, in Providence and other places as well. Uh, on a more national data scale for people who want to share their experiences, um, Vivian Shaw is the primary investigator of a huge project out of Harvard, collecting data on AAPI incidents of hate and really, really trying to like get the kinds of data that are important and disaggregated and, um, you know, take all the different things that we've taken, talked about today into consideration. So Vivian Shaw over at um, Harvard and the AAPI project there. And then lastly, I think because we do need to uplift um, some of the organizing of Southeast Asian communities and right here in Providence, the work of Providence Youth Student Movement and ARISE, the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians have been doing incredible work demanding like curricula, civics curriculum for our students that really, really reckon with like different moments of, you know, important histories, but connecting them, finding different ways that we're all connected. So you have like a local piece there, a more national piece, and then a, a data resource for anybody Fantastic. who's interested in. We'll put up a, you know, an info card in this episode after we talk for people to stop the, the video and take, take a note of it and write it down because that, that's really important. You know, you ended on a really important um, piece of this puzzle, which is, you know, not only having, you know, an outpouring of compassion and, you know, empathy, which I'm for, I don't want to be condescending, but at the same time, you know, you want that to lead to something because coming out of an African-American community where there's a, quite a bit of legacy of violence, I've noticed that one can have a kind of ritual cycle of empathy without any change. And so, you know, this is important to me that, that we figure out ways to be in the proper solidarity across various racial groups who are themselves perhaps differentially positioned, but nonetheless part of this broader system. And so what you've described is so important there is curriculum because we all need it uh, and in alignment with organizations that are doing the work on the ground. Um, so, I mean, I, I really wanna thank you for that because you know, this is not George Floyd, this is another thing and it's deserving of its own full attention. But when we really pull the lens up, which you're doing in your really brilliant work, you begin to see, oh, there are all kinds of networks of connection that are often rendered invisible by the single empathetic story. Um, yes, absolutely. And I think to that end, to like young people and to students who feel like none of these things have been addressed by, um, their education system, I think I want to tell them to, to slow down and to not worry that their pain will only be visible for the two weeks of this new cycle. I think there's a complete urgency around young people, people on our campus, high school students, that like this is the moment they need to grieve and they need to act, and they need to figure it all out and have a voice, you know, within this month or it's going to be lost. And I think to like just trust that we're building something here and trust that you have, a, you know, you, you have 
incredible time ahead of you to continue doing this work. And it doesn't all have to be recognized right in this moment. Right. And honestly, you know, I would also encourage them to realize that the, the frame of recognition that is being set up now may not be the frame of recognition that you want to carry forward because the terms of what they're asking us to, to, to accept, it's implicit in the, in the narrative, right, that's out here is something that you've just pretty much dissembled. <laughs> you know, you just took it apart like a beat up old car. And so, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, you want to sort of use the momentum but as I couldn't agree more that this is a long-term project and it's really getting people to see the difference when there isn't a killing, to see what's yes. going on where there isn't, you know, a, a massage parlor, when there isn't a crazy white guy with a gun, when there, you know, it's, it's those moments. That's where you started us out so smartly. This is the systemic practices that are sort of quiet behind the scenes, invisible violence that that that's where our work, I think, can be most effective in the long run. Elena, you rock. Thank you so much for coming to join us here. Um, I, I give last words to you. Anything else? I mean, I think you've said it all, but just in case something came to mind, I just want to give you the floor to um, to just end, end us off here. No, I just, I really hope that we can get that message about endurance to young people. Uh, I hope young people are listening. And if they're not, we're going to find a way to revamp this format to get it where it needs to be heard. We'll, we'll do our best. We'll get, make sure we get it out on Twitter and everywhere else and, and <laughs> promote it. No, I, I, I really do agree with you about that. So, because, you know, we want to honor their pain and their frustration and their outrage because that's yeah. worthy of, of honor and respect. But also to say, hey, look, you know, you've got to, you know, you're going to go up and smoke yourself if, yes. you know, because this is, you know, if you get to my age, you realize, oh, okay, this has happened 45 times in my life. Okay, it's a long distance run. So anyway, but thank God for them and thank goodness for you. We really appreciate you, Elena. Thank you for Thanks joining more. us on Underlying Conditions. You come back anytime. Thank you, Trisha. Thanks to everyone at the CSREA working so hard beside the scenes always. Love okay. to you all. Thank you, dear. All right. Thanks everyone for joining.